Wow, what do I say? Okay, so let's just dive into it. Oklahoma beats Texas in an all-time classic Red River shootout yesterday, 55 to 48. I caved a little bit. I got to tell you, I was doing pre- and post-game hits on CBS Sports HQ, and I called it the Red River Showdown. And for that, I apologize, because this was a shootout of epic proportions. This is the best college football game I've ever seen in person. It's right there at the top of the list. I don't have to really wait to marinate on that. It is the best college football game I've ever seen in person. It is one of, if not the very best, college football atmospheres and settings I've ever seen. I was telling direct Colin before the show. I said, Colin, I've been to a lot of big games. We go to the, probably the biggest one or one of the biggest ones in the country every week. I get to be in person to see the best that college football has to offer. Sometimes you go to an event and either because of the game being lopsided or just the event itself being overhyped or the stadium and venue being overhyped, it doesn't quite live up to it. It's good, but it doesn't quite measure up. The Red River Shootout and the Cotton Bowl there in Dallas for this game, even though it's really, really hyped nationally, I still think it's underrated. After what I saw yesterday and what I experienced, I really think it's still underrated. There's not a better setting in college football. I don't know what else to tell you. The people who have been to the game know what I'm talking about. Everything's just great. Everything's just perfect. The way it's set up, uh, the 50-50 crowd split, the fact that there are no luxury suites in the stadium means you don't see a single sweater vest, you don't see a single bow tie, it's 92 degrees, people are pouring sweat, but it's diehard college football fans. It's not corporate. The last word anyone would have used yesterday is corporate. To the point, I kid you not, where midway through the second quarter, when Texas scored one of like 17 touchdowns they did in the first half, I look to my left, and there are cheerleaders. I look to my right, Mark Cuban standing next to me. That's how it can happen sometimes there. Just a random billionaire standing next to you. Why? Because there's no suite for him to be in. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And then the game happens. And the game, like I said, got to be the best I've ever seen in person. Seen multiple national championship games, multiple conference championship games. It doesn't get better than yesterday. And if you watched, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't watched, if you were watching other games yesterday, if your team was playing and you were just getting score updates, which must have looked like a video game, by the way, this was not, to me, one of those classic, no defense being played anywhere, cheap points after cheap points. It wasn't that kind of game. True enough, Texas folded, in some cases, accordion style, defensively in the second half, but it was still there to be had, and Oklahoma took it. Such a classic game. So let's dive in. It's one you don't analyze. Yesterday, I was talking to Hakeem Dermish on CBS Sports HQ for the post game. I said, I know the tendency is to analyze and to talk about this big play or this big player. But these kinds of games, I don't know. You can say that, hey, uh, Spencer Rattler gets benched and Caleb Williams goes off. And boy, that's a huge story I'm about to talk about. But there were so many people who went off. I mean, hats off to Kennedy Brooks. After that Bijan Robinson talk, and he fulfilled on that, by the way, yesterday to Bijan Robinson, one of the most incredible runs you'll ever see. But after hearing that talk all week, and after hearing people all season accurately tell you that Oklahoma's ground game and offensive line hadn't quite lived up to preseason expectation, Kennedy Brook just went off, including putting the nail in the coffin at the end of the game, had over 200 on the ground. Hats off to him. On the other side, Xavier Worthy, that's a kid we talked about for several shows in August, getting you ready. In fact, we said specifically about his name. In big Texas games, you're going to hear the name Xavier Worthy because that's the guy that gives them the best deep threat potential. He was committed to Michigan, couldn't get in up there. Long story, but long story short, he's at Texas now. He is the closest thing to being the embodiment of the skill set that Sark had at Alabama. Texas folks know this. The nation knows it now. He had, what, nine catches for over 250 yesterday two touchdowns, had an unfortunate special teams play, but that's a true freshman, just walked in the door, didn't even plan on playing for Texas initially, and what a weapon he was. So he goes off. I mean, you got, I think, Casey Thompson, if he hadn't already confirmed it in everyone's mind, doubly and triply stamping the idea that that's his job. So he went off yesterday. But the story, obviously, was Spencer Rattler starting, Spencer Rattler getting shook again by a moment too big for him, and Spencer Rattler getting benched. And Caleb Williams coming in, much to the delight, and I can't stress this enough, the supreme delight of Oklahoma fans and his team, body language, important, read it every now and then, and he won the game for him. 
And not only did he win the game, this wasn't, this wasn't even. This wasn't apples to apples. They were down by 18 multiple times were the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, I, I, I could not be any more impressed. And so there are a lot of things, a lot of different ways you can go with this. But I think the thing to take away is to me, this is an entirely new Oklahoma team now. Make no mistake, when you have that kind of confluence of events happen, when you come all the way back in a game of this magnitude, when you've played close games before this year that may have given your organization reason to doubt itself internally a little bit, and then you get down to the degree they were and you come back and you do it with your backup quarterback, who absolutely is now the nucleus of your program and the starter moving forward, or at least he better be, and then a team that is very talented realizes what it's capable of, you might as well have flipped a switch. You might as well have called yesterday week one for Oklahoma. Because my hunch is moving forward, I'm not telling you they're gonna win a national title. I'm telling you the new version of Oklahoma, the team you'll see moving forward, is gonna be a whole lot more likely to fulfill on that immense preseason expectation, number one hype, than the version we had seen so far. That's the kind of stuff that totally switches a season and turns it on its ear what you saw Oklahoma do yesterday. Those experiences, by the way, are so much better for you down the road than winning a blowout, 42 to 10. In the moment, everyone wants to win comfortably. But ask the championship teams, the ones that have ended up getting it done at the end, that have crossed the finish line, and they'll tell you some of the most important lessons and some of the most critical parts of the DNA that ended up making up the identity of this program, they were forged in knife fights. Games that maybe we had no business being close in but had to find a way to win, or maybe instant classics like the one Oklahoma played in yesterday. However you achieve it, when teams can taste their own blood and then get off the deck like we were talking about with A&M, being a competitor and a supreme competitor at that, you just handle adversity differently. The great ones out there handle it differently. Most folks aren't great. Most teams aren't great. That's why most teams would have folded yesterday. Oklahoma didn't, and it's going to pay dividends for them down the road. Now, there are a couple of different angles you can go at with Texas, too, because I took away a lot of positive. It's the first year for Steve Sarkeesian. Great pair of pants he wore into that place yesterday, by the way. But you can look at it one of two ways. You can say, it was great to see them get off to a fast start, which is true. It was great to see them go on the offensive. It was great to see the moment, well, at least at the beginning, not be too big for them. All that is true. Like They validated a lot of what you hope the future of Texas football will be yesterday. But I was over on Horns 24-7, and I was reading Mike Roach's stuff. And he made a good point, and it's harsh, but I do think it's valid, and I do think it's accurate. That was a choke job by Texas in the second half of that game. As much accolades as you want to throw around, or as many accolades as you want to throw around for the first half, what else can you say? It's 41-23, to guys. It's 41-23 Texas late in the third quarter. And Oklahoma ripped off a 32-7 run to close that game out. And there are a lot of different points of blame. To me, I didn't hear B. John Robinson's name called nearly enough in the second half from my taste. Their drive chart, Texas second half drives. Three plays, eight plays, three plays, three plays, six plays, six plays. 32-7, that's how that happens uh, in the second half. And so what do you make of it? Moving forward, what does it mean? Well, I think what it means is there are some good pieces there The concept is good, like the philosophy is good. Sark doesn't have all the players he needs yet, but to me, the net result is it's a bitter pill to swallow, but I think it really gives you a ton of juice in recruiting for Texas to go out and say, listen, it's year one, okay? And that team over there that we narrowly got beat by, that's a team that a lot of people think can win a title. They've got a several year head start on us. We let them. And the difference is in the second half, if I'm in the living room of a recruit, I'm telling that kid, they had more guys like you than we had. We showed you how we can start. You are the kind of kid that can help us finish. And we're going to get a lot of them just like you. That's what I do with it. That's how I packaged that game up yesterday. Because there's a lot to be proud of. There's a lot to be aggravated about. And, you know, the greatest coaching staffs out there, they can harness both, really. They can harness both. Now, the question is going to be, for Oklahoma, you know, they've got so, – so let's talk Texas since the schedule's up. Texas played OU. They get no bye week. They've got Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State off a of bye week, by the way, this week. That's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a really tough game. Oklahoma State's undefeated, by the way. Texas incurs their second loss. Uh, it's going to be very tough. How do you get your kids back? How do you get your team back? I'm not a big fan of that scheduling dynamic, to be blatantly honest with you. I don't think the Big 12 cares, but I'm not a big fan of that. 
But for Oklahoma, I think they got TCU this week. They're an 11 and a half point favorite at last check. If I'm right, and if that switch has been flipped, you will see a different Oklahoma team. In fact, if I'm right and I wanted to put my money where my mouth is, I would start betting blindly on Oklahoma minus down the stretch because their spreads in the second half of the season are going to be based on the team they've been so far. If I'm right and they're going to be the team they've been so far plus a bunch, then it stands to reason they should cover these numbers and get some margin on these teams. I'll be really interested to watch that. But what a game. Best college football game I've seen in person. Cannot speak highly enough about the experience and the atmosphere there. I'm going to talk more about that on the Tuesday morning podcast.